Andy Kahn says he's the most famous musician you've never heard of, and he lives right here in the desert. Andy is his own rock and roll hall of fame. He's crossed paths with some of the music industry greats, as you'll find out this morning. He joins us. Welcome, Andy. Hey, I'm really happy to be here, Joe. This is great. Well, speaking of happy, isn't that one of the songs um, that you did with the Turtles? Uh, <laughs> now yes, that I think happy, of it. <laughs> so happy together. Yeah. Best song was ever written and sang. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you've got a fascinating story, and it's really a who's who of people in the music industry. I want you to drop the mic a little, and I want you to just rattle off just a few of the people that you've worked with. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, Ringo Starr, Harry Nielsen, Jimmy Webb, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Seals and Crofts, Dr. John the Night Tripper, Eric Carmen, John Bonham, uh, Mitch Mitchell, uh, Global George, uh, Richie Hayward. I mean, the list, if you look at the index of my book, it's a book in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I mean, that is pretty impressive when, when you consider you started in New York. I want you to give me a little bit of backstory. And when did you decide, you know what, the thing I want to do most in life is I want to create music. Well, you know, it's really a, a wonderful childhood I had. My parents always supported everything I wanted to do. And uh, at 13 years old, I wanted to be a movie maker. So I made Frankenstein and Frankenstein meets the Wolfman and Revenge from Planet Four. These are all eight millimeter sound movies that I made in my neighborhood with all my uh, childhood friends. Anyway, uh, I loved classical music. So I would use De Meister Singer or Flying Dutchman Overture or The Rite of Spring or The New World Symphony just as background music to these movies. Uh, and then uh, uh, I heard a song by Del Shannon called Runaway. Oh, gosh, what a hit that was. And I taught myself on the piano how to play the, the uh, organ solo. Uh, but later on, my sister said, why don't you uh, watch the Ed Sullivan show tonight? They got a group called the Beatles. And of course, Joe, that was it for me. I mean, that completely changed my life overnight. I wanted to be a Beatle. <laughs> so and, did uh, a lot of people. <laughs> and I actually went to the pharmacy uh, 1964 and bought Permastrate for my hair. So I could have straight hair because I had curly hair then. So I, I wanted to be a Beatle so bad. I wanted the Beatle haircut with the straight hair. And it lasted really good for about an hour. Then it all frizzed up. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I started a band called The Individuals. And I played the Farfisa organ. It's a combo compact organ. The same organ that they use on the Wooly Bully and come on down to my boat, baby, and uh, Paul Revere. A, a lot of bands use this organ, along with the uh, Vox Continental organ. Those two organs were very popular in the '60s. So, so did I you go to did you go to school for music, or was this something you just picked up? I, I I taught myself how to play the drums by listening to Meet the Beatles album. I, I had a, uh, my cousin gave me a drum set so I would turn on the phonograph as loud as I could and play the drums along with every song on the Meet the Beatles album. And that's how I taught myself how to play drums. And uh, I, I knew how, a little bit about the piano. My father actually taught me how to play left hand and right hand uh, lead and melody uh, with the Snake Charmer song, you know, the one that goes, anyway, so he showed me uh, with the left hand, do the lead, bum, 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 and with the right hand, do the bum, 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 and then switch them. <laughs> so the left hand will go, bum, 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 and the right hand will go, bum, 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 
So he, in five minutes, he taught me how to play left and right hand lead and rhythm. Uh, Unbelievable. That was and, my only, yeah. <laughs> that was your that only, was only foray into piano. But then how did you take what you learned from that and then translate it into leaving New York, heading to Los Angeles, and connecting with all of these great musicians? Uh, and how did you become the great musician you are? Well, it's 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 a wonderful story. My my lead singer in my New York band, um, he was crazy. He was the best singer I knew, but he was crazy. So uh, I was with my girlfriend uh, up in my bedroom at my house, and he came into my living room and found my movie camera, the same one I made all these movies with, and he stole it, and he took it to a pawn shop and sold it. So I got really angry and I got a hold of his girlfriend and I asked her to go come to California with me and she said, <laughs> as <"Yeah."> revenge, <laughs> as revenge. I got revenge on my lead singer. Wow. I'm so I, I would imagine that that relationship ended pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, are but, talking. Uh, we are talking with Andy Kahn. He is the author of the most famous musician you've never heard of. Uh, but you are hearing about him now because he has such a wonderful backstory of the music that he's created with so many superstars. Uh, so you got to L.A. and you started working in the studios. How did you knock on their door and say, I, I want to be uh, in this studio. I want to play. I, I want to create music. How did that happen? My mother was very good friends with Erwin Gar, who was the president of Pulsar Records, a subsidiary of Mercury Records. So I was a gopher. You know, uh, Xerox photographs, uh, you know, coffee, <laughs> take the musicians to the studio, do all that. So on the label was Graham Bond from England. He was a blues artist who played, uh, who had uh, Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce from The Cream in his band before they met Eric Clapton. So he was uh, an artist on this label and he calls me up, he says, Get your harpsichord, which I was playing an electric harpsichord, going through a, a Leslie speaker in 1968. So I got my VW bus and got the harpsichord and picked up Graham. And we went to uh, TTG Studios in Hollywood. And Mitch Mitchell was setting up the drums. Uh, Jack Cassidy from the Jefferson Airplane was on the bass. Uh, Lowell George, Little Feet, he was on the flute, and Graham was on the Hammond B3, and I was setting up my harpsichord, and I felt something behind me, and I turned around, and in walks Jimi Hendrix with uh, two girls, uh, one carrying his amplifier and one carrying his guitar. So he, he sets up right next to me. So I'm 20 years old got goosebumps and Hendrix starts doing the uh, the blues in A and I'm freaking out. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. So uh, that was my first introduction to any kind of a recording session, you know, on a professional level at 20 years old. So was Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix at that point, or he was just trying to get started too? He was a big star at that time, at 1968. He, he already had two albums out, and he was huge. And uh, it was just uh, the most amazing time. I wish I had a cell phone then so I could do a <laughs> selfie with him. Uh, so this continues and continues. And I know that you played uh, for quite a while with the Turtles. How did that come to be? Because they were, they were such a great group. Uh, my friend Scooby, Frank Sorkin, was the uh, Musicians Union representative, and he turned me on uh, to Jimmy Carl Black, who was the Indian of the group with Frank Zappa. 
So we started a band called Geronimo Black. And Frank Zappa at that time was making the movie 200 Motels. And so Jimmy uh, was in the movie. So I went to rehearsal uh, with Jimmy just to see what it was like. And uh, Flo and Eddie, Mark Volman and Howard Kalin, were there uh, in the movie also rehearsing. Uh, in fact, they sang the background vocals on Lonesome Cowboy Bird, which is the Jimmy Carl Black song in the movie. Anyway, so I got to meet the Turtles. And then later on, um, after I did some work with Little Richard, I went to a, a, a studio called Cherokee, and I was doing organ overdubs for the soundtrack for the movie. And uh, Flo and Eddie were doing a cartoon soundtrack called Dirty Duck. Uh, so uh, Mark Holman said, uh, Andy, we need a keyboard player for the road. Are you available? And I said, yes. And that was in September of 1973. And ever since then, all the way through 2012, I was in the Turtles. And uh, it was amazing. You mentioned um, Little Richard. On some of the notes about your book, it says, what eye-opening question did the legendary Little Richard ask Andy when they were on the road together? So that piqued my interest. What did he ask? Well, <clears throat> uh, as, as a lot of musicians know, Little Richard was both ways. And uh, he had a crush on me. He liked me. Oh, and, okay. Uh, <laughs> he thought I was very cute, and he, he invited me up to his penthouse, and he asked me to do uh, something, and I said, Richard, you know, I got, I like girls, so uh, that was the end of that, but he still liked me, and we were still friends, and... Uh, there are other things in the book that I think people will be fascinated with. A chubby checker. I had the, the privilege, I guess, of interviewing him uh, not, not too long ago uh, in Portland. Uh, he didn't seem to be the, the, the warmest person or as, as gracious as I thought he might be. What was your experience with Chubby? Well, uh, the Turtles did a, a, a whole tour in Las Vegas, you know, all the casinos and and, you know, Laughlin and all that. And uh, we did a, uh, um, a 60s revival concert where the promoter said, a dress in tie-dye shirts and look like a bunch of hippies from Woodstock. And so we all dressed up like that and we played the concert with uh, Felix Cavalieri of the Young Rascals and Chubby Checker. We were on the bill with the Turtles. So uh, we played the concert, and Chubby was great, and the, the show was terrific. And the next morning, uh, I'm at the lobby, uh, you know, checking out. And uh, at the end of the hallway, uh, Chubby Checker was with his mother, and his mother was sitting in a wheelchair. So Chubby looks at me, and he recognized me because, you know, we were hanging out backstage, and he gives me this maniacal look. <laughs> Like he's, you know, ready to kill. And he, and he takes the wheelchair and he runs at full speed right toward me with his mother sitting in the wheelchair. And then he just zooms right past me laughing. And his mother was laughing. And so I got almost run over by Chubby Checker and his mother. <laughs> he thought that was funny. I, I, it was so hilarious. I couldn't believe how funny that was. So over the, so over time, I would imagine that you got to know some of the people pretty well, and others maybe not as well. Uh, you know, on the road or or in uh, in the studio. What are some of your most favorite moments in creating the music? At the time, you thought, well, I think this might be a hit, but I'm not sure. Well, you know, I've been a sideman all my life. I never myself had a hit record, which I'm hoping before I die, I get something going. But uh, I've got some great uh, songs that are, you know, uh, I have one song called Late Bloomer that is really uh, doing well. It's got 31,000 
views on YouTube, and and uh, it's a really good song, and a lot of people are playing it. But uh, you know, uh, I'm just really grateful that uh, I was able to experience uh, meeting all these icons. I mean, uh, that's the reason I wrote the book because I'm a pack rat. I saved everything. You know, the calendars, the contracts, photos tapes, albums, all that. And uh, I said to myself, this is amazing. I'm going to put together a book. So I scanned every photo and every flyer and poster and contract. And I put this book together. And really, I'm very happy with it. It came out great. I got, uh, you know, like 40 review, uh, five-star reviews on Amazon. And it's, it's only been out a year. And my only promotion is Facebook. I don't have the budget to hire uh, a, uh, you know, $3,000 a month uh, promotion company. So were there some songs that you played on that you hear on the radio today and it brings you back to that period in time when you were in the studio and doing the job? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a wonderful album on Columbia that Flo and Eddie did, uh, The Turtles. It's called Moving Targets. And uh, there's several songs on there. One of them is called Keep It Warm, and it features my piano. Uh, and when I hear that on the radio, it, it's so wonderful. And uh, uh, so uh, there are, uh, you know, I never, uh, I never recorded Happy Together, but I played it live thousands of times, you know, so... Uh, were there were there times when you actually played on some of the Turtle records as well as well? No, I, I joined the Turtles after the Turtles when they were Flo and Eddie in 1973. The Turtles broke up in 1969, and then they Boy. joined Frank Zappa. You know, it's funny you say that because you know the the Turtles and those groups never seem that they went away because we keep hearing the music. And so we kind of think in our mind, well, they must be together. But it seems as though, remember on MTV, they would do documentaries on these different groups. And it was always, by the fall of 1968, tragedy struck. <laughs> you know, it was always one of those things. I, was that because it was just the time or what? That after a while, these bands just couldn't hold it together? It's a very strange time. Uh, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and the lead singer for Can't Heat, they all died in the same period of time, uh, whatever year that was. And uh, it was, uh, there's nothing like the 60s, especially 1966, 67, 68, 69. Those were the most magical musical years for me. Absolutely. What do you think of the music today? Yikes. Um, <laughs> well, that yikes. could be yikes. That's terrific. Or yikes. Yikes. <laughs> it, it, it's really funny. I'm sure you've experienced this too, that the music that you liked when you grew up, your parents didn't like. That's right. <laughs> so it's the same thing with me. All the hip hop and rap and all the other stuff that's coming out, I don't enjoy it. I don't like it. I can't, I, I, it doesn't do anything for me. I'm, I'm stuck in the 60s. I'm and that's really that's not there. bad. I mean, you know, back in the 60s when the Motown sound was was so prevalent, I, I remember, you know, my dad um, introducing me to Billy Eckstein and uh, what I mean, what a voice. And ironically, Billy Eckstein recorded for Motown, which a lot of people don't know, I, yeah. you know, but but you are so right when you say, well, you know, as a kid, you don't like what your parents listen to and they don't like what you're listening to. But it seems as though the 60s uh, was a time that I think the majority of people liked what was going on, would you say? Yeah, my parents loved the Beatles. Uh, you know, the Beatles uh, will last forever. They're the most amazing phenomenon in music. I mean, uh, Elvis Presley, yes, and, you know, other stuff, but 
There's nothing like the Beatles, I'll tell you. They, they are the reason that a lot of big stars became stars because of the Beatles. If you are just joining us, we are talking to Andy Kahn. He is uh, the author of The Most Famous Musician You've Never Heard Of. He lives here in the desert. When did you move here? Uh, 2005. My mom passed away and I inherited, uh, inherited her home. And uh, that was around 2005. So I've been out in the desert since then. And I performed at every venue you can imagine. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine that. I, it seems to me that you like to work. Well, I love music. I mean, uh, the pandemic has really stifled uh, a lot of musicians because they, you know, really can't perform sometimes. But uh, some places are opening up and casinos are, have always been open because, yeah. But uh, it's, uh, it's my love. You know, music is it. You mentioned uh, the Beatles and, of course, Ringo Starr. And um, this I kind, kind of uh, find fascinating, but also troubling. Uh, you know, he wanted to work with you, but then he threatened to sue you. Why would he do that? Come on, Ringo. <laughs> oh, he did. His attorney sent me a letter. Um, what happened was Ringo came over to my house with Harry Nielsen. And we Name dropper. <laughs> and we we recorded some children's stories on on my little studio. And uh, uh, at the end of the recording session, I said, "Ringo, uh, I have a flavor to ask you." And he goes, "A flavor?" And I said, "A favor. Would you let me? Uh, is it okay if Harry takes our picture?" And so Ringo says, gold is always a price to pay. And uh, so I got a, a photo of me and Ringo that Harry took. And then I said to Ringo, I said, hey, Harry, get in there. Let, let me take a picture of you and Ringo. So both of those pictures are in my book. And uh, it, it, um, it, I, I, I just got to tell you this one thing. In 1968, I was in my Hollywood apartment. And I had a premonition that a beetle was in my house and he was sitting next to me with his shoes off. So in 1992, Harry Nielsen brings Ringo over to my house and it was 100 degrees out and I had to turn off the air conditioner so it wouldn't pick up on the mic. And Ringo sat next to me and he took his shoes off. So it's like that was... So okay. are, are you going to open up a psychic shop uh, in the desert? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that really is, isn't that's forward thinking. That's yeah. for sure. So when you look at your career and, and what you've achieved, are you surprised at, at how far you've come from, you know, a, a small town in New York <laughs> to, to being with all these people and creating all this great music? It's amazing. It really is amazing. The only thing I'm a little bit, well, I'm not disappointed, but I wish that I had the monetary success of a lot of these people. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still a starving musician, still <laughs> at 74 years old. And all these celebrities, you know, I still, you know, I guess it's my own doing, but whatever the case is that, that's my only regret. I wish I, I, I made it to a level where, you know, I, I was very comfortably numb. But right now, uh, I'm still a starving musician trying to make it like everybody else. But see, here's the thing. Did you have a plan B in case this music thing didn't work out or not? Nope. I was uh, stubborn, very stubborn. Uh, I, I, uh, when I was married, my wife would yell at me. She said, go dig a ditch, go sell a dictionary, go do something. And because I wasn't making any money, there was no music jobs for a while. And, uh, but I'm so very that, stubborn. But see, that's got to tell you something that if you didn't have a plan B or you weren't willing to do something that you didn't want to do, then it just goes back to having the passion for what you set out to do. Yes, I agree. 
<laughs> yeah, that's. It. But I'm, 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 I'm happy. I'm living. I'm breathing. I'm not in a hospital. I don't have COVID. I mean, those are so important to me that I'm, I'm functioning. You know, and 74 years old. I never thought I'd be 74 years old. <laughs> but do you feel 74? That's the question. <laughs> well, uh, my body sometimes does. But when I look out of my eyes, everything looks the way it looked when I was in my 20s. You know, <laughs> were, were there times, you know, when you were going through the 60s and we we hear the stories of uh, sex, uh, music, sex and rock and roll. Right. Maybe how, that isn't how they say it. But but, you know, er everything that was going on during that time, which led a lot of people who were in the industry to kind of lose everything. I mean, were there any times during that period that you thought, well, I might want to partake of that or this and, uh, or, or did you kind of escape that? No, I wanted to partake in anything that was available. Uh, I was very excited about entertaining and being on a stage. I love entertaining. I love the, uh, the, the feeling when people come up to you and say, wow, you were great. Uh, really enjoyed it. You know, it, it's nothing like it. It's, it's the best reward in the world. Okay. But I'm talking about when you weren't on stage <laughs> oh. and, and all the things that surround entertainers that they, they might be swayed to protect, uh, you know, to participate in that they shouldn't. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, uh, um, I'm not quite sure what your question. Well, is. you know, if it were it, drugs and uh, too much, uh, too much, uh, too many women, you know, that kind of thing. Oh well, I, I did do a lot of drugs and I did do a lot of women, so I was really into it. I was <laughs> enjoying it. And and so, any regrets about that? Well, no, actually, no. I I, I never uh, got any. Uh, venereal disease and i didn't uh, pass out from an overdose so uh, i survived <laughs> well <laughs> and you still got a smile on your face uh, yeah. so if somebody is interested in in reading more about the most famous musician you've never heard of how, where where can they get the book it's really easy to find the book if you google the most famous musician you never heard of my name will pop up immediately You'll hear this lady's voice going, Andy Kahan is the most famous musician you've never heard of. You know, it's the Google search. And, and my, uh, this wonderful article my editor, Jeff Tremarkin, wrote uh, that's in a website called Best Classic Bands. It's got a sample chapter from my book with Harry Nielsen, Ringo, uh, Timothy Leary, Joe Walsh, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. Uh, so... The easiest way to find it is just Google the most famous musician you never heard of, and you have the option of uh, buying it on Amazon, because I self-publish on Amazon, or you could uh, email me. They have a link on this website, and then I can autograph a book and send it to you. Wonderful. Who was the best person you ever worked with or for? Little Richard, hands down. He was the most amazing entertainer, a uh, goosebumps all 20 for the whole show. I was in goosebumps because the guy had so much energy and his vocals were dynamite. I mean, he was incredible. I mean, so he was the best uh, I've ever worked with. But but being in the same room with Harry Nielsen and Ringo Starr and uh playing music with them and uh, doing the Grammy Awards with Little Richard and Chuck Berry and having them rehearse uh, the show with me with just the three of us in a small little back room with the upright piano. Uh, the Beatles idolized Little Richard and Chuck Berry. Uh, Paul loved Richard and John loved Chuck. So here I am full circle with Little Richard and Chuck Berry. So Stuff like that is uh, unforgettable, amazing stuff.
Well, Andy, it's been a pleasure to uh, pick your brain and to uh, kind of go down memory lane back in the 60s. Continued success. I know uh, that you will be around the Valley playing and, and people can uh, check that out as well. But what a pleasure to, uh, to meet you and to talk with you. Joe, thank you so much. I'm very grateful. And uh, you've got a great show, I'll tell you. Thank you.